It's probably a very Argentinian thing as well. It's like when, when people are sharing a mate as well. Um, what happens there is um, you have the person serving the mate and presenting it to a person and if they accept they, they have a few sips and uh, then they hand it back and the person would fill up and pass on to the next person and it would do the rounds until you say gracias and that actually means thank you I've had enough so if you're dancing with someone and you've come to the end of the tanda and you say gracias thank you that means we're ending the dance now project it on to because I think it's important to let the dancers know that this is orchestra playing now um, what era it is and then people get to know, like, ah, oh, that's the Dusarli sound, or that's the Dariensa sound. And uh, there's different eras as well. So what I'd inform the users about is which orchestra is playing, which song is playing, and what year the song is as well. Because there's, there are distinct differences between the different eras. So you'll have the 1930s very rhythmic tango. The 1940s is more melodic and lyrical tango. And... Uh, the earlier tango would be a far simpler rhythm, um, more predictable, and the later tango would, would be more complex with little elements that the dancers can use to play with and, and be more creative with. Um, and uh, so I'm trying to get people used to the structure of a milonga. Um, there's a lot of the culture, the, the cordigos, the codes, um, and uh, it's also about the um, predictability so that when a dancer hears like oh this is Canaro or Disarli then they then they can decide right okay this is a dramatic kind of piece I like dancing with her you know um, and then they know the next three or four songs are all of the same orchestra the same era um, and it's not unpredictable it's not going to be suddenly changing from rhythmic to melodic and back to rhythmic and then something grand and then something quiet so as to, to give a kind of flow to the evening so you can gradually build up the energy and then bring it down again, calm things down again, build up to a climax, bring it down again. So it gives a bit of a, a gentle flow to the evening then. So what, what, what you do there is you'll see not only for the people who are dancing but the people who just will do everything on the fly. They will, it's very important for a DJ to be very perceptive and feel, see, perceive what the mood is like, what the atmosphere is like on the floor. Um, if the dancers have been dancing for many hours and it's been very energetic and they're getting tired, then the DJ has to pick up on that and start playing more calmer, more lyrical songs. And uh, um, so the DJ constantly has to be aware and be prepared to change things. Um, so you might detect, now it's time to calm things down a bit. What I do is I prepare a playlist more or less with the structure of the evening and then I change it during the evening. So I'll, I'll decide like, okay, now it's time to bring up the energy a bit. Let's, let's get a bit more rhythmic, you know, stronger stuff. Or, you know, the dancers look a little bit tired. Um, there are also different genres in tango music. Um, you have your three genres, tango, which is very melancholic. Um, and then you have your vaults, which is light and, and more kind of like breezy, floaty kind of music. And then you've got your milonga style, which is more um, playful and, and a little bit faster. So what, what, what you do there is you'll see not only for the people who are dancing, but the people who are sitting down. They might be sitting down because they're tired, or they might be sitting down because they, they're waiting for something more energetic to come up. So you want to give the dancers a bit of variety. Um, so essentially I follow a structure where um, I'd have three tangos playing a cortina, another three tangos, cortina, and then I'll go into a valse. Back to tango, a few tandas of tango, and then milonga. Um, so that everyone's tastes are catered for, um, and a good mix of orchestras as well, so people have different things to play with. So there's a lot of variety then, um, not to keep the same energy the, the, the whole time through. There are, um, I'd say, probably six big names. Um, those would be orchestras like Canaro, Fresero, Di Sarli, D'Arienzo, Firpo, and Pugliese. 
Um, those are the, the six most widely played orchestras. Um, and there are a few songs which a lot of people recognize. Um, one of the famous songs being La Composita, which is almost the national anthem of Argentina. Um, not really, but it's, 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 so, it's so widely played and it's usually used to close off the evening as well. And uh, um, so usually um, if a person's going out to buy some music, they'll buy something from one of those six orchestras. Um, but there's a wealth of tango music out there. Um, I have, my collection is probably about 4,000 songs. But if you were to look at the entire collection, means I think um, Francisco Pinado alone recorded over 2,000 tracks. But um, you would, he would, there would only be a few hundred which are suitable for dancing. Um, the majority of music is really not suitable for dancing. Um, so the DJ has to really select what are the most danceable songs out there. And um, in total, they, they, they'll probably be, I mean, I've got a collection of probably about 2,000 danceable songs, but there might be 10,000 songs out there, so that would be about 20% of them all. Um, so there are a few big, big orchestra names in them, um, a few more um, uh, other popular orchestras as well, and a few obscure ones that no one's heard of. And I think it's important for the DJ to keep listening and discovering new music. I think that's part of being a DJ is, is always picking up on something. If they go to a milonga somewhere else, to Buenos Aires or somewhere in, in, else in Europe, um, I'm always hear, listening and hearing, wow, I've never heard that before. Which orchestra is that or which song is that? And uh, constantly um, having an inquisitive mind and, and trying to find out these things. There, there are some, the, the dance event is called a milonga, um, and there are some that are um, traditional. Uh, they would only play traditional music, and there's some which are called um, alternative milongas, maybe, um, and uh, which contain more like tango nuevo music, contemporary tango music. You also get modern orchestras interpreting the old classics. And then you get music that is not tango music at all, but it has a very distinct rhythm. Um, there's, there's stuff by Tori Amos, Tom Waits, um, Leonard Cohen that people dance to. Um, I am personally a, a traditional t um, tango fan. I, I fall in love with a, with a traditional tango. Um, but they, there's often a demand for other non-tango music as well, which is suitable for dancing. So I often get requests to play that. And what I'll often do then is maybe once an hour, on the hour I play um, a bit of non-tango music. And it's nice because it gives a bit, of a, bit more variety and changes the mood somewhat. Often it's very calm and relaxing music. Um, so just to give people a bit more variety. People don't talk while they're dancing because it takes a lot of concentration. You're, you're constantly, for the leader, he's looking at the dance floor, navigating the dance floor, trying to not bump into people and listening to the music and interpreting the music, communicating that to his partner. But on the, on, on the sides, the people who are sitting down, they want to, um, they want to it's a very social dance. Mm -hmm. So um, people are chatting away and so on. Um, and uh, so sometimes people are sitting bec for, for various reasons. It could just be because they, they're tired or they're waiting for a particular tender. And some people have specific tastes. Some people like dancing to a waltz. Other people like dancing to a milonga. Other people like lyrical tango. And that's why it's important for the DJ to give to cater for the dancers, um, DJing has to be egoless. The DJ has to kind of disappear into background, and um, it's not about the DJ himself. It's not about showing off your collection of music. It's about catering for the needs, for the desires of the dancers. So the DJ has to be perceptive and see if people are sitting down, why they're sitting down. Maybe they're waiting for something specific. So variety is very important, I say. In, in tango, as I said before, you, um, you, you want to, when a dancer hears a particular song coming up, they might realize, ah, this is decidedly coming up, one of my favorite orchestras, and it's a 1940s one that's maybe more lyrical than, than, than a 1930s one, and um, the dancer would look for a particular partner to dance with. So what they would want then is to ha know that for the next 10 minutes or so, that the music is going to be more or less the same. Um, so what we do is we structure the music. It's called a tanda. It's a group of three, four, maybe five songs that are played in sequence, usually fr um, from the same orchestra, 
possibly featuring the same singer, um, always from the same genre, either tango or milonga or valse. And uh, um, then at the end of the tanda is a, what's called a cortina, which is like a curtain. And that comes from the tradition with live orchestras where they would play a set of songs and then the curtains would be drawn. And uh, then either another orchestra would come on or they'd, they'd, they'd open the curtains again and, and they'd start off with another set. So that fits in very much with the culture, with the codes, the códigos, um, in that it gives a, a way for people to, um, to stop dancing. And traditionally in Argentina, they would clear the dance floor then. And that opens up the dance floor so that people could then scan around, look around for the next partner they want to dance with. And there's a term called cabeceo, which means making eye contact and nodding the head, um, uh, inviting the person for a dance. So the cortina is a very important function because it indicates at the end of one tanda and the beginning of a next tanda, which will feature another orchestra. And that is the little period during which people would often then try to establish eye contact and invite a person for, to dance the next tanda with them. I've met a few Argentinians in Ireland who started taking tango lessons for the first time, who never danced tango in Argentina. And there are various reasons for that. One girl I spoke to, um, I said to her, how come you never learned tango in Argentina? And she said, well, when she was young, el tango fuero para los abuelos. It was for, for older people. Um, it wasn't popular for, for a few decades. It was highly popular in the 20s, 30s, and 40s. And then with political and social changes in, in Argentina in the 50s with the military coup, tango became less popular. There were influences from North America, rock and jive and everything. Um, and since the late 80s, early 90s, there's been a revival which has really picked up in, in, in this millennium. And um, I think a lot of times, many Argentinians, when they live abroad, after a few years, they maybe start getting a little bit homesick and, and they try to connect with their roots again. And so they rediscover what, what they might have lost back, back at home. And it's, it's often to do with, with technology as well, because in the 1920s and 30s, you didn't have recorded music, or not to the extent that you have now. Um, so when people wanted to dance, when, when they wanted entertainment, they had to dance to live music. And so they were, there was a big demand for musicians, for orchestras playing music. Um, so um, nowadays things have changed and the DJ is a pretty, pretty recent phenomenon and they didn't have DJs in the 1920s and 30s. Um, we are really, um, we are really only just reproducing, we're pushing buttons and recreating the atmosphere that the real musicians did back then. Um, yeah, it's, um, it's basically, we, we, we're fortunate to have this archive of, of music that, that we can continue listening to. But we are not able to create the exact same um, atmosphere that was created back then with the live orchestra. It just doesn't exist anymore. The social conditions and um, with technology, with recorded music, you simply cannot have those big orchestras that you, you had back then. Yeah, I've been, I've been um, DJing for two years now and, and mostly on the Irish circuit around Dublin in, in local milongas. But um, there's quite a lot of festivals happening in, in Ireland nowadays. So um, I'm here in Galway at the moment and in April there's a festival coming, coming up in Cork. I'll be DJing there for the third year in a row. And run by, in August there's an international tango festival happening in Dublin as well. Um, and there are various other events happening throughout the year. Um, people bring in really good um, guest teachers and performers, sometimes musicians as well. So the, the tango scene in, in Ireland is really, really quite active and uh, an act, uh, a passionate following as well. Because tango is not an exact kind of dance, it's, um, it's, a, it's an improvised dance and um, you need to adapt the way you dance according to the music, according to the venue, according to the partner that you're dancing with as well. Um, there are slightly different ways of, of doing things. 
um, it's very much about interpreting the music. So I try to learn from as many different teachers as I can, um, because from each teacher I take a little bit and I internalize what works for me. Because what works for me, for my body shape or for my mood, um, might not suit someone else. So I think it's important for people being a social dancer to dance with as many people as possible and to learn from as many people as possible. It's like a rising tide lifting all boats. It's, um, it's promoting and, and encouraging tango for, for the whole of Ireland. And uh, um, I think with events like this, we'll see more people going to other cities and partaking in festivals and going to local milongas. As with the way I dance, the music I listen to is constantly evolving. Um, my first um, favorite orchestra was uh, Francisco Conaro. Um, and quite since then, I've really grown to appreciate Di Sarri's orchestra as well. And um, I love the rhythmic Darienzo orchestra. It's constantly changing. And it will be very difficult for me to have to choose one particular orchestra. Um, I love Edgardo Donato. It's beautiful, beautiful music there. Um, it would be very difficult. If I had to choose one, um, I guess at this stage it would probably be my, my first favorite, Canaro.